Welcome. Let's look at the intercoastal spaces. These are spaces seen between adjacent reefs and coastal cartilages. Remember our lecture on the thoracic cage? If you've not checked that lecture, or please kindly go and do so to align with this lecture. In that lecture, we said that the reefs span from the vertebral column posteriorly to the sternum anteriorly. So the spaces between adjacent reefs and also the coastal cartilages are referred to as the intercoastal spaces. And this is the intercoastal space, arrowed red, because we have 12 pairs of reefs, 12 on the right and 12 on the left. This will mean that the number of intercoastal spaces will be 11. So we have 11 intercoastal spaces and the intercoastal spaces will be numbered by the reef that is superior to them. Let's take this for illustration. This is the first rib. This is the second rib, third rib, and we have the fourth rib. So if you look at between the third and the fourth rib, we have this intercoastal space. So this intercoastal space would be the third intercoastal space because the rib that is superior to this space is the third rib. Let's look at the functions of the intercoastal spaces. These intercoastal spaces are not left open. They are padded up with muscles, and that is the corresponding name muscle, the intercoastal muscle. This muscle helps to keep the rigidity of the thoracic cage. So it helps to strengthen or give it structural stability. These are the intercoastal muscles highlighted in red that are seen within the intercoastal spaces. And this muscle also enhance respiratory processes because they help in either expanding or reducing the capacity of the thoracic cavity. And we know that this is basic for respiratory process. So as they tend to contract or relax, they are helping to adjust the cavity of the thoracic space. So these spaces also create accommodations for coastal vessels. This we'll see as we go through with this lecture. So going further, let's look at the boundaries of the intercoastal spaces. Each intercoastal space is bounded superiorly by the inferior border of the rib and also the corresponding coastal cartilage. If you look at this image down here, this is the intercoastal space where we have the intercoastal muscle. And if you look at it superiorly, it is bounded by the inferior border of the rib and also the corresponding coastal cartilage, which is located at the front. And inferiorly, we have the superior border of of the rib that is seen below the intercoastal space and also the corresponding coastal cartilage which is located anteriorly and this is the inferior border anteriorly it is bounded by the lateral border of the sternum this is the sternum highlighted in green it is seen in the anterior part of the thoracic cage and the lateral wall of the sternum is seen to form the anterior border of the intercoastal space and this is where the anterior border is. Then posteriorly, it is formed by the thoracic vertebra. And this is the posterior border of the intercostal space where the thoracic vertebra is seen at the posterior median plane of the thoracic cage. Let's look at the subdivisions of the intercostal spaces. The intercostal spaces can be further subdivided into two. Remember we said that intercostal spaces are spaces between adjacent ribs and coastal cartilages. And this is where we have the ribs. Anterior continuation of the ribs are the coastal cartilages. And these are the coastal cartilages at the front. So this space can be further subdivided into two by this demarcation. And this is the demarcation between the ribs and the coastal cartilages. So we have a region that is seen specifically between the ribs and also the space that is also seen specifically between the coastal cartilages. And that is the basis for this division. The, so the region of the intercoastal space that is seen between the ribs are called the interosseal space. It is a subdivision of the intercoastal space, but it is specifically the region that is seen between the ribs. Why the region that is seen between the coastal cartilages at the front is called the intercartilaginous space. And this is the intercartilaginous space in the anterior part between the coastal cartilages. So let's look at the content of this space. We said that this space is not left open. It is seen with a number of structures. One of the structures that is seen within the intercostal space are the intercostal muscles and also the intercostal membrane. We will see the relationship between the intercostal muscle and the intercostal membranes as we go further with this lecture. We will see how they are placed 
within the intercostal spaces. And these are the intercostal muscles. And we also have the intercostal vessels. And this includes the intercostal vein. And this is the intercostal vein. We also have the intercostal artery. And this is the intercostal artery just inferior to the vein. Then finally, we have the intercostal nerves. And this is the intercostal nerve. These are the structures that are seen within the intercostal spaces. But let's take these structures one after the other to see where they are specifically located within the intercostal spaces. So let's look at the intercostal muscle. Intercostal muscles, we have three and they are in layers. So we have the external intercostal muscle, which is the most superficial. So when you are dissecting from superficial to deep, the first layer of the intercostal muscle that you would see is the external intercostal muscle. And this is the external intercostal muscle. Then deep to the external intercostal muscle, you have the internal intercostal muscle. And this is the internal intercostal muscle. Then if you go further deep, to the internal intercostal muscle, you have the innermost intercostal muscle, and this is the innermost intercostal muscle. Let's drive in further to see how the fibers of these muscles run, and also specific features that they present. So let's first look at the external intercostal muscle and also the external intercostal membrane. Let's see the relationship between the membrane and also the muscle. So for the external intercostal muscle, we already said that it is the most superficial muscle. And the fibers of this muscle are seen to run inferior medially, which means that they run inferiorly and are directed towards the median plane. And this can be just opposed with the presentation of the color of a shirt. The color of a shirt, the way it runs inferior medially can be used to represent the pattern by which the fibers of the external intercostal muscles run. These fibers, when seen in the posterior part, the pattern by which they run tends to change. If you look at the direction of these fibers, not taking it to the posterior orientation, you will see that at the posterior part, the external intercostal muscle will be running inferior laterally. But in the anterior part, it is seen to run inferior medially. These external intercostal muscles are 11 in number, and this is understandable because we have 11 intercostal spaces. And this is the external intercostal muscle. Also, let's go to the origin and insertion of this muscle. This muscle we originate from the superior rib and also be inserted on the inferior rib. But let's see the specific region of these ribs, where they originate from and where they are also inserted on. So the fibers we originate from the lower border of the superior rib. This is the superior rib. Of course, the lower border of the superior rib is where they will originate from. And they are inserted on the upper border of the inferior rib. Also, more specifically, the region where they'll be inserted on is the outer lip. So they originate from the lower border of the superior rib and are inserted on the outer lip of the superior border of the inferior rib. So you should understand deeply where their fibers originate from and also where they are inserted upon. Also going further to establish the external intercostal membrane. The external intercostal membrane is seen as anterior continuation of the external intercostal muscle. In this image down here, this is the external intercostal muscle that is highlighted in dotted blue. We already said that this muscle is seen at the most superficial part. So when you are dissecting, it is the first muscle of the intercostal muscle that will be seen and if you look at this muscle from the tobacco of the ribs at the posterior part where it connects with the thoracic vertebra, you see it is seen as a muscular presentation until when it gets to this anterior region. And this anterior region, specifically in the costochondrial junction, is where it's now become transformed into a membrane. And this is called the external intercostal membrane. And this is where we have the external intercostal membrane. This membrane can also be referred to as the anterior intercostal membrane because it is seen in the anterior part of the thoracic cage. And of course, the external intercostal membrane because it is a membranous continuation of the external intercostal muscle. So you can see how the name is being drawn. So the external intercostal membrane is seen at the intercartilaginous space because we already subdivide the intercostal spaces into two, the interosseous space and also the intercartilaginous space. We already know what the interosseous space is, which is the space that is seen between adjacent ribs where the intercartilaginous space is seen between adjacent costal cartilages. Specifically, the external intercostal membrane is seen along the intercartilaginous space because we say that it is at the costochondrial junction where the muscular presentation is seen to be transformed into membrane. So it is at this region that we have the presentation of the external intercostal membrane as the anterior replacement or continuation of the external intercostal muscle.
Also, this external intercoastal muscle is supplied by the intercoastal vessels. Intercoastal vessels that will be supplying specific external intercoastal muscle will be of the corresponding level. We already established that this is the third rib and this is the fourth rib. This intercoastal space is the third intercoastal space because it will be named based on the ribs that is seen above it. So for this specific external intercoastal muscle, it will then be navigated by the third intercoastal vessel. So you can see how this is also presented. The intercoastal vessel that will be supplying this external intercoastal muscle will be of the corresponding level, and that will be the third intercoastal vessels. Also going further, let's look at the internal intercoastal muscle and also the internal intercoastal membrane. Let's see how this membrane is also presented. In this regard, we know that the most superficial is the external intercoastal muscle. And deep to the external intercoastal muscle, we have the internal intercoastal muscle. So this is the internal intercoastal muscle, seen deep to the external intercoastal muscle. So talking about how their fibers run, we already established that for the external intercostal muscle, the fibers run inferior medially, just as the color of a shirt, that is in the anterior part. And when it gets to the posterior part, based on the pattern by which they run in the anterior part, if you try to translate the pattern to the posterior part, you see that it will be running inferior laterally. So you can see how that is established. But for the internal intercostal muscle in the anterior part, the fibers run inferior laterally. And it's, of course, this run in opposite direction of the external intercostal muscle. So if we have the fibers of the external intercostal muscle running in this direction, that is inferior medially, on the anterior side, the internal intercostal muscle will be running inferior laterally. So they will be running, you know, crossing it in the opposite side. And that is the pattern by which the internal intercostal muscle run in the anterior part. Also, when they get to the back, the fibers also will change because for a fiber that is running inferior laterally, when they get to the back, it will be translated to running inferior medially. So it's just like a word and opposite thing. We're talking about the origin and insertion of this muscle. This is also going to be very interesting. For the internal intercostal muscle, let's use this image down here. This is the internal intercostal muscle that is seen deep to the external intercostal muscle. Of course, they will originate from the superior rib and will be inserted on the inferior rib. That is known. But looking at the specific region where they will originate from and also be inserted upon. For the origin nation they will originate from the inferior border of the superior rib also will be inserted on the upper border or the superior border of the inferior rib so let's drive in more specifically so the fibers of the internal intercostal muscle will originate from the coastal groove of the superior rib and where they will be inserted on is on the intermediate lip of the upper border of the inferior rib Remember that the external intercostal muscle is inserted on the outer lip of the upper border of the inferior rib. The internal intercostal muscle will be inserted on the intermediate lip of the upper border of the inferior rib. So you can see that they are gradually taking it from the outside to the inside. And that is the pattern that justify how they are presented. We already said that the external intercostal muscle is seen to be superficial because the fibers are inserted on the outer lip. Why deep to the external intercostal muscle, we have the internal intercostal muscle. And this is seen deep to the external intercostal muscle because the fibers are inserted on the intermediate lip of the upper border of the inferior rib. So you can see that they're already been positioned according to what is seen in the real life. And this is where they originate from, from the coastal group of the superior rib and are inserted on the intermediate lip of the upper border of the inferior rib. It is important to understand the basis of how they originate and also how they insert. So talking about the internal intercostal membrane, the internal intercostal muscle also has a membrane. We said that the internal intercostal muscle is highlighted in dotted red, and of course, seen deep to the external intercostal muscle. So this is the internal intercostal muscle. And from the anterior part, they appear muscular until when they get to the angle of the ribs at the posterior part where they are now being replaced by a membrane. So this is the internal intercostal membrane that is seen as a posterior continuation of the internal intercostal muscle. Remember when we discussed about the external intercostal muscle, we said that it is in the anterior part that it becomes transformed or replaced by a membrane that is called the external intercostal membrane or the anterior intercostal membrane because it is seen in the anterior part. So the internal intercostal membrane is seen in the posterior part so it will be referred to as the posterior intercostal membrane or the internal intercostal membrane because it is a membrane of the internal intercostal muscle so that is how the name is being established and if you understand this basis you will always remember what it means 
also the internal intercostal muscles supply by the intercostal vessels, just as what is presented in the external intercostal muscle. So going to the innermost intercostal muscle, the innermost intercostal muscle also comes with its own features. So let's try and unfold this. We said that the innermost intercostal muscle is the deepest, and this is the innermost intercostal muscle that is highlighted in dotted grain. This innermost intercostal muscle, of course, is the deepest, and it is seen at the posterior part of the intercostal spaces. This would establish, as we go with this lecture, for it to be seen at the posterior part, it means that the point of origin and insertion will be at the posterior part of the ridge. But let's see how this will be unfolded. Also, talking about how the fibers run, the fibers run almost in the same direction as the internal intercostal muscle and this is the pattern by which they run but the only thing is that they are more vertical you can see that the pattern by which they run is directed more vertical even though they run in the same pattern the innermost intercostal muscle is seen to be lost in the upper intercostal spaces. So in the superior intercostal spaces, the innermost intercostal muscles are absent. So we do not have up to 11 innermost intercostal muscles. That is what it means. Also, talking about the origin and insertion, in order to establish why they are seen at the posterior part of the intercostal spaces, we know that, of course, they will originate from the superior rib and will be inserted on the inferior rib. Then talking about the specific point of these ribs, where they originate from and also where they are inserted upon. So this is the innermost intercostal muscle here. They will originate from the superior rib, but it will originate from the posterior region of the lower border of the superior rib. And that is understandable. And that is why they will be seen at the posterior part of the intercostal spaces. Also where they are inserted upon is on the inner lip of the upper border of the inferior rib. We already said that the insertion will be on the inferior rib, but it will be inserted of course on the upper border, but specifically on the inner lip. And the inner lip will be at the posterior part. And that is why the fibers of this muscle is seen at the posterior part of the intercostal spaces. And this is the posterior region of the lower border of the superior rib where they originate from and are inserted on the inner lip of the upper border of the inferior rib. So we can see how this is presented. And because of their point of origination and insertion, this will now make the innermost intercostal muscle to be positioned at the posterior region of the intercostal spaces. Also going further on the innermost intercostal muscle, three over four of the deepest region of the intercostal spaces are occupied by this muscle. Some we say the central two over four region. What is now placed in the anterior and the posterior region? What we have in the anterior region is the sternocostalis. That's the, the muscle that connects the sternum with the costal cartilages. And also posteriorly, what we have is the subcostalis. And this subcostalis is seen at the posterior region of the innermost intercostal muscle. So you can see that the central portion is where we have the innermost intercostal muscle. Then deep to the innermost intercostal muscle, we have the endothoracic fascia, which is the fascia that is seen to line the interior wall of the thoracic cavity. And this is highlighted in purple. The innermost intercostal muscle is also supplied by the intercostal vessels, as stated for the other intercostal muscles. So let's talk about the intercostal vessels. These intercostal vessels are seen between the internal intercostal muscle and also the innermost intercostal muscle. Remember, we have three muscles that are arranged in layers within the intercostal spaces. We have the external intercostal muscle, we have the internal intercostal muscle, and we have the innermost. Remember, we already said that the innermost is seen at the posterior part of the intercostal spaces. The intercostal vessels are seen between the internal intercostal muscle and also the posteriorly positioned innermost intercostal muscle. So they are seen between these two muscles. And this is the way they part within the coastal groove. Remember the coastal groove is an indentation that is seen in the lower border of the ribs. We have the intercostal vessels in this region, but are seen between the internal intercostal muscle and the innermost intercostal muscle. They also have a pattern by which they are arranged. And this is tagged with van. So the first vessel that you see on top is vein. And inferior to the vein, you have the artery, then you have the nerve. So that's the way that they are arranged. So let's look at this image to explain further. Let's say this is the entire configuration of an intercostal space. In the external part, we have the external intercostal muscle, and this is highlighted in blue. Deep to that, we have the internal intercostal muscle, and this is highlighted in black. Then the deepest layer is the innermost intercostal muscle, and this is highlighted in purple. Then we have the intercostal vessels seen 
between the internal intercostal muscle and the innermost intercostal muscle, and this is where they are located. And of course, the first vessel that is seen most superiorly is the vein, which is the intercostal vein. And deep to that, we have the intercostal artery. Then deep to the artery, we have the intercostal nerve. So this is the pattern by which they are arranged within the intercostal spaces. So let's take the intercostal artery. The intercostal arteries that are seen within the intercostal spaces are divided into the anterior intercostal artery and posterior intercostal artery. These two arteries, they emerge from different vessels. So let's see where these vessels emerge from to make this lecture more grounded. This is going to be very interesting to look at. So if you look at the anterior intercostal artery, which means that these arteries are seen in the anterior part of the intercostal spaces. So this is the sternum in the anterior part. And of course, we have the ribs spanning away from the lateral border of the sternum. So this is what is pictured here. This is the presentation that is seen in the anterior part of the thoracic cable. And this is what we'll be using to learn how the anterior intercostal arteries emerge. For the anterior intercostal spaces, we have nine anterior intercostal spaces. The 11th and the 12th rib do not span through to the anterior part, so they are still floating along their path, so they do not have the grace to extend to the anterior part. So instead of having 11 intercostal spaces in the anterior part, we have nine because of the 11th and the 12th rib that are floating ribs because they do not extend to the front to be connected to the sternum. So for the upper six anterior intercostal spaces, we have branches from the internal thoracic artery. While the lower three, which is from the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth intercostal spaces are supplied by branches from the musculophrenic artery. So let's see how these branches emerge. This is the subclavian artery. And we know that the subclavian artery is branched from the hack of aorta. If you've not checked up my lecture on the subclavian artery, please kindly go and do so to keep yourself updated. So this is the subclavian artery. And we know that from the subclavian artery, we have a branch that is called the internal thoracic artery. And this is the internal thoracic artery. And from the name of this artery, we know that this artery emerges from the subclavian and it runs along the anterior thoracic wall, just as the name implies. So this artery runs and descends down just at the level of the cyst intercostal space. It's bifurcated into two. So it's bifurcated at this region and it bifurcates into the superior epigastric artery. And the superior epigastric artery will descend down along the anterior abdominal wall. Then we have the second terminal branch, which is the musculophrenic artery. And this musculophrenic artery, you can see it as it emerges from the internal thoracic artery. You see it running along the costal margin. And the reason for running along the costal margin is to give branches to the lower anterior intercostal spaces. This we will see as we go further with this lecture. So let's go back to the internal thoracic that emerges from the subclavian. This internal thoracic will give off branches to the superior cis anterior intercostal spaces. And this are highlighted in green. And this we have the first anterior intercostal space, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So they give off branches to supply the upper six anterior intercostal spaces. And this is what is presented here. Of course, we know we have nine intercostal spaces in the anterior part, and we have explained why that is so, because of the floating ribs that do not have the grace to extend to the anterior part. For the lower three intercostal spaces, which will now be the seventh, the eighth, and also the ninth intercostal spaces, will be supplied by branches from the musculophrenic artery. We already said that this musculophrenic artery is one of the terminal branches of the internal thoracic artery. And if you see the pattern by which it runs, we said that it runs along the coastal margin. And this part is justified because it gives off branches to supply the lower anterior intercostal spaces. And that is what we have here. So we have the seventh, we have the eighth, and we have the ninth anterior intercostal spaces. So the lower three are supplied by the musculophrenic, while the upper six are supplied by the internal thoracic artery. And this is one of the branches of the musculophrenic artery that gives to supply the lower three anterior intercostal spaces. Then going to the posterior intercostal artery. In the posterior region, we have 11 intercostal spaces. So the intercostal spaces in the posterior part are complete because all the ribs emerge from the vertebral column. The upper two spaces 
are supplied by superior intercostal artery, while the lower nine are supplied by branches from the thoracic aorta. So let's see how this also is presented. Remember we said that this is a subclavian artery. The subclavian artery, we already know that is a branch from the heart of aorta. From the posterior part of the subclavian artery, we have the emergence of the costocervical trunk. And imagine at the back of this region, it's able to give branches to supply the superior to intercostal spaces at the back. So we have a branch at the posterior part of the subclavian, and this branch is called the costocervical trunk, and this is the costocervical trunk. So from the costocervical trunk, we have the emergence of the superior intercostal artery, and this is the superior intercostal artery highlighted in green. This artery gives off branches to supply the first and the second superior intercostal spaces. So you have one branch here, you have another branch here. These two branches supply the first and the second superior intercostal spaces at the posterior region. Because we have 11 intercostal spaces at the posterior region, it means that the inferior intercostal spaces will then be nine. And these nine inferior intercostal spaces are then supplied by branches from the thoracic aorta. And this is the thoracic aorta highlighted in red. The thoracic aorta, is the initial segment of the descending aorta. And the thoracic aorta, as it descends down, it gives off branches to supply the lower nine intercostal spaces at the posterior part. And this is one of the branches of the thoracic aorta that supplies the inferior intercostal spaces at the posterior region. So we can see now that the anterior and the posterior intercostal arteries are from different branches. Not only that, the upper region and the lower region are also being supplied by different arteries. And it was good that we looked into this. Also going further, the intercostal vein. Intercostal veins accompany the intercostal artery. And we already established the pattern by which they are related with the intercostal artery, which is established as van. So we have the vein first, followed with the artery, then we have the nerve. This is the intercostal vein highlighted in blue. It is seen running through the costal groove and within the intercostal spaces. These veins drain into the azygous vein. This is the azygous vein highlighted in black, which later drains the blood into the superior vena cava. Okay. And this is the superior vena cava. We know that the superior vena cava will unite with the inferior vena cava to form the vena cava. And this is the inferior vena cava arrowed purple, and this is the vena cava highlighted in green. This vena cava drains venous blood into the right upper part of the heart, where we have deoxygenated blood. So that is the part by which they run. They are finally emptied into the vena cava, which is, of course, collected into the right side of the heart. Then we have the intercostal nerve. The intercostal nerves are anterior rami of thoracic spinal nerve. This is the intervertebral foramen, the foramen that is created between two vertebrae. And this foramen is so created to allow the exit of the spinal nerve root. So we have the intervertebral foramen. From this foramen, we have the emergence of the posterior ramus and we have the anterior ramus. It is from the anterior ramus that we have the intercostal nerve. So these are the intercostal nerve running through the intercostal spaces. And of course, we already established the pattern by which they run. As they run forward, they are seen at the most inferior part of the intercostal vessels. And this is established with van. Clinical application. Let's look at intercostal nerve block. This is used to disrupt the flow of signal along the intercostal nerve. And of course, this is done to relieve pain. It can also be used for diagnosis. When an anesthetic agent is injected into the nerve, it will help to block the transmission of signals. So pains are not felt because of this blockage. Thoracentesis. Thoracentesis is a procedure that is used to remove fluid or air from the pleural cavity. And in this process, the needle is inserted through the intercostal spaces to enter into the pleural space. But the needle is directed in a particular way because we have the intercostal vessels within the intercostal spaces. So as to prevent the needle from damaging the intercostal vessels, the needle will be passed through the upper border of the rib. 
And this is the pattern by which they will be directed at the upper part, because at the lower region of the rib is where we have the coastal groove within the intercostal spaces. And this is where the coastal vessels are located. So if it is directed below it, there's tendency that the needle may eat the intercostal vessel. So let's look at this question. The first one is to describe the structural outline of the intercostal muscles. This we have adequately explained. The second question is to explain the origins of the intercostal arteries. This is a very interesting question. So thanks for watching. Let's meet again in our next class.